Thank you for listening to the message today. We would love for you to share in the comments how God is speaking to you through his word. If you would like to join our online church community, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon on our YouTube page so you're notified when we post a new weekly sermon. You can also learn more about The Rock Church by visiting our website, rockag.com. If you are in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, make sure to come visit us for Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. We would love to meet you in person. And if you would like to support this ministry today, you can donate by visiting our website and clicking the giving tab at the top of the page or by texting the amount you would like to give to the number 84321. Then follow the instructions in the text reply. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. You act like you mean it. I do too. It's good to be here. Praise God. Uh, Sunday's still my favorite day of the week. Has been ever since I gave my heart to Christ. I couldn't wait to get to church on Sunday. And then by accident, we learned about Sunday school. We don't have it here anymore. But we showed up early. The time changed where we were. And we showed up. We didn't know what they were doing. And so that we're having a Bible study. And we thought, oh, we're going to try that out. And then it, we did. And then we found out, like we have here, there was a midweek uh, Bible study. There was something for the children. There was something for the teenagers. And when we find, found that out, we, yeah, yeah, we want to be a part of that. So anyway, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, we're moving on from Easter, but we're not moving on from the resurrection. <laughs> Because we can experience the resurrection every day of our life. I do have, and we've tried our best, as, as best we possibly, possibly could. And on another note, too, here in a couple of weeks, we're going on a mission trip to Tisto. And so if you'll make that a matter of prayer, we're taking a team up there to partner with the Tisto Church, a men's and women's conference slash training with Pastor Catherine Pierce who's pastored that church. Yeah, your dad knew Catherine. They networked some when he was up there, Yvette. So please keep us in prayer. I have so little, it's really uh, heartbreaking news, but I need to tell you, is our friend and our brother, David Rowland, went to be with Jesus just a couple of days ago. And uh, Lynn is with his mother as we speak and her children. There's been an... Uh, it's just, I'm just, it's just one of those tough ones because David touched so many of our hearts. As y'all know, he was on our advisory council. And just, I think about the Rock Church and David's fingerprints are all over this place and all over our hearts. And dear friend of us, many of us. And so uh, keep Lynn and the family in prayer. Um, the funeral, we don't have the time set, is the last Saturday of this month. So they needed a few weeks to get all the things they need to get in order. And more details to follow. Uh, I will tell you, and I, I could write a book on David Rowland, uh, maybe a, a couple of volumes. Uh, but he wouldn't want us to be sad. You know, he served God basically all his life. And Friday morning, about three in the morning or so, he stepped into eternity. And I couldn't help but think of him nonstop for a few days. Uh, he loved praise and worship. He really loved to worship. I know he sit right back there in that corner because he was serving us in a number of ways that you'll never know. Uh, but he loved to worship. And so he's worshiping at the throne of God. This morning, I'm so thankful uh, when we lose a loved one, when they know Christ, we know where they are. Praise God for that. Well, we're going to get on with uh, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, for a few weeks. I'll just tell you ahead of time, it's not extensive. We're going to spend five or six weeks there. We could do six to ten lessons per chapter. Easy. There's been books written of 2,000 pages or more on chapter six alone. And so I'm going to make some simple touches along the way. Let me unpack it just a little bit. Uh, the church 
in Ephesus was officially started in Acts chapter 19 when Paul visited uh, the church in Ephesus. Uh, found 12 guys that had been saved under John the Baptist. And I got a little bit of ring, I think, up here probably. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, part of his ministry, had won 12 people to the Lord. And I think this is interesting, what I'm getting ready to say, although I'm not going to teach down that path. When they found these men, Paul found these men, they had given Christ their heart. You can look it up in Acts 19. And, and uh, they had been baptized in water and they were saved. But Paul said, did you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit after you received? They said, no, we don't even know what it is. And so then Paul explained to them what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. Now you're saved because of the power of the Holy Spirit. But there's a distinct and subsequent experience all throughout the scripture that I te teach often. There's a power of baptism that comes to all believers that are hungry for it with evidence of speaking in tongues. And so Paul gets to this church and they said, no, we haven't even heard of, heard of that since we uh, believe. And guess what happened? Paul laid hands on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. <laughs> and I love that story. I love to teach that text. I'm just giving you a little context for today's uh, message. Uh, so we had a tongues interpretation in tongues today. And you read about that in 1 Corinthians 12, as Pastor Jill mentioned, where there's, when there's a message in tongues from God to the people, it requires uh, an interpretation, which we had. But there's, see, it's hard for me. I love the Holy Spirit, y'all. Without the Holy Spirit, we don't have any power. Uh, I mean, none. He is the power. He is the comforter, Jesus said. He is the counselor. He is uh, uh, all, of those, all of those things. But there's, there's eight or nine uses for tongues. Some people get bogged down on, well, they prayed in tongues and there wasn't an interpretation. That's not what just all tongues is for. And it may be time to, we're going to go to the four-week series on the Holy Spirit and kick it off the day of Pentecost, have a, an anointing line and believe for salvation and believe for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and a fresh baptism, healing, signs, wonders. I believe God still does all that. So just kind of getting you out there a little bit. But that's what was happening here. And they experienced that uh, power baptism. And he, uh, he hung around the synagogue roughly three months and he was teaching uh, Jewish folks and people uh, leading the synagogues. And then he experienced, and obviously I'm condensing and paraphrasing, got a lot of criticism about preaching Jesus. And so he moved on uh, to a school, Tyrannus, if you, if you look it up. And he stayed there about two years. And he became very attached to the church in Ephesus. Uh, it was a place where people loved Jesus. It was a place where... People were full of the Holy Spirit, operating in gifts, just like we did uh, this morning. It was a place, really, where, in a sense, revival broke out, and people were getting saved and finding Christ in one of the most pagan metroplexes or, uh, in history. It, uh, it would rival anything that we know about today. And it's not getting any uh, better in some ways in our culture. It's getting worse. Uh, but even in Ephesus, part of the worship at the big temple there, they had orgies in the street. Hundreds. So, I mean, I'm just illustrating a little bit that he was preaching the gospel. People are getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. He ha hangs around t uh, two years. He's appointing elders, pastors, and God is moving in a city where the primary little G gods, because there's only one God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Come on, give me an amen. amen. And, and, and God's moving. And he's touching hearts where most of the culture, and it was a crossroads. So people were coming from all over the known world on a regular basis. And God was moving in the midst of demonic worship uh, and all that garbage. And so... I, I still believe the Lord can do anything. 
The scripture does teach us when you read the book of Romans that as time goes on and you could look in the revelation at the end that times will get worse, but God's grace will get greater. And you can do that study and you can find all scriptures uh, for yourself. So fast forward with me. We know that Paul wrote uh, almost half of the New Testament in letters. The, uh, the book of Ephesians was a letter to the church in Ephesus. And he's encouraging them. And he's, uh, uh, he's in prison. He's in prison. I, I, I thought, you know, sometimes life throws us a bad turn and we just shut down. Maybe sometimes when life shows us a tough turn, we ought to ramp up. Because <laughs> Paul wrote several of, it, of the books we read today when he was suffering in prison. It wasn't easy then, not easy now. And so he's writing to the church in Ephesus. And some things, I ch- it's a, not a long book. I would challenge you this, re- uh, this week, maybe read the whole book. We're going to park there about five, six weeks. And, but you'll see something by him, through him, in him, for him, through Christ. And so uh, Paul would say, and the title of my short series is The Key to Life. There's a key to life, and his name is Jesus. And here in uh, Ephesians, those key, key, that key and the keys that go with the key, Jesus, is being unpacked. Now, I don't know about you, but I lock my door when I leave the house. Everybody's nodding. They're, who doesn't lock their door? Don't tell anybody. We'll get over there and get some food out of the fridge. <laughs> we'll send the food hounds to wipe you out while you're not. No, I, I was raised... I was raised in a day, uh, we didn't lock our, our house or car. I mean, probably up to, golly, 15, 16 years old. Uh, but it's not that day anymore. I would advise you, on a side note, lock your house and lock your car. <laughs> I mean, it's just a wise. But you can't get into your house or your car unless you've got the right keys, can you? How do you feel when you lose your wallet? Yeah. How do you feel when you lose your, now the cell phone rivals the wallet. I mean, I feel lost. And what about your keys? Oh my goodness, we were uh, uh, on a little fishing expedition a few weeks ago and we stopped at this marina restaurant. I forgot something in the truck and so I went back to the truck and unlocked the truck and set my keys down on the seat and got what I needed and locked the truck and closed the door. And I went, rawr, rawr. <laughs> I didn't have the keys to get in. Asked the daughter if she had her set. Well, I always ask her just to leave her pocketbook home. That one's on me. You got to have the keys. It's true in our daily lives. It's true in our Christian life. If you're going to live an abundant Christian life, and I'm really just going to unpack some very simple principles the next uh, few weeks. But if you're going to live the abundant life in Christ, there are certain keys, certain things in God's Word that you must understand and apply to your life. You can understand Scripture all day, y'all, but if you don't make application, it's not going to do you any good. So maybe put another way as I'm unpacking this this morning is you need to know the basics. Now, for those of us that have been around like forever, uh, you know, you've heard a version of, you've, you've heard a version of everything I preached 10 or 15 times. God's word never gets old though. And even when I'm studying just the basics and ministering the basics, we still need the basics. I know some of y'all love uh, professional uh, baseball, and I know the Diamondbacks are like people are going crazy about them. I'm getting some thumbs up there. Do you know their hitters still hit sometimes a thousand balls a day off a tee, tee ball, and it's so that they can get to keep their fundamentals straight. The best athletes in the world still go back to the basics. I think the folks that walk closest with Christ and are fruitful in Christ are the folks that by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that's always standing on the basics, always practicing the basics. And so that's 
kind of the direction I'm going to take y'all uh, the next few weeks. Read with me Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And here we go. As for you, look at your neighbor and said, that's you. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Now remember, he's writing to saved people in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We're going to read one more verse, but when you are disobedient, there's usually another spirit at work, and it's not the Holy Spirit. It's either the flesh or something else. I love these verses. <clears throat> All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Folks, before Christ, we were dead. I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual and, yes, even an emotional death. Because when you're spiritually dead, it affects everything in your life. We were dead. The scripture here this morning just bluntly tells us that we were all dead. Before we knew Christ, church in Ephesus and the scribes writing for Paul, before you knew Christ, you were dead in trans your transgressions. Even this morning, if you've not made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you are dead in your transgressions. You're dead. We're going to get to the good news, so hang on with me. It's clear. So if death here doesn't mean physically, then what does it mean? It doesn't mean my heart stopped beating physical heart or my brain has quit working. And, and let me say, according to the scripture, those who don't make Christ their Savior will go to hell. People don't like to preach that and people get, but it's true because that's what the Bible teaches. That's death. That's, that's eternal death. Anybody want to go there? Not me. So what is death ultimately? And I'm going to try to get, it's separation from God. Because God is the only one that can save. God sent his son to mankind, Jesus, so that anyone that would repent and believe and believe in him would have a bridge through Christ, would have a bridge into heaven and eternal life. And not just eternal life, but I believe the key to this life is also having Christ in your heart. It's terrible to be separated from God. Do you, like me, remember when you were separated from God? Now, let me say something. God is always with you because in his love, he loves you. He wants you. He'll roadblock you. He'll show himself to you. He, 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 but you have to make a choice to ask Christ in your heart to be saved. You have to make a, a choice in your heart so that you can have life on this earth and eternal life forever. Sunday school preaching. Somebody give me an amen. You watch, and I've watched, and I'm not being critical with this statement because Jesus loves everybody. I'm here. Aren't you glad he first loved you? Aren't you glad, as the scripture says, that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died at Calvary for you? What a God we serve. What a Jesus we serve. But you watch, and I'll tell you, I was a young Christian. I went to Manhattan. I like to visit Manhattan. You couldn't pay me to live in Manhattan. But the pizza and the subs are great. I would fly to Manhattan and stay three days just to eat pizza and the subs. <laughs> it's the truth. And I walked those streets when Dave Wilkerson planted his church in Times Square was my first time in Manhattan, and we were witnessing on the streets. He and Bob Phillips and Dave's brother founded Times Square Church. That's been, that's telling my age, if you know the background, 
there. And people were alive physically, but they were walking down the street dead. And in Manhattan, it's 24-7. The sidewalks at 3 in the morning in Manhattan are probably more crowded than the Phoenix sidewalks at noon. And that was the first time it hit me, which now has been 30 some odd five, is there were men and women walking dead. They were alive, but they weren't alive. Walking here, running there. But when I walked those streets, trying my best to witness, you could look in their eyes and there wasn't any light. There's a lot of good people that don't have Christ that are lost and dying and going for he- to hell because they're dead in their transgressions. And you can see it in their eyes. I've never watched what I'm getting ready, but I've seen a few clips. I don't get these zombie movies. If you're a zombie movier, don't tell me. I don't care. As long as you can keep your heart pure, I don't care what you want. But the clips I've seen, it's like, and I mean, they don't even fight anybody. I mean, you can take a baseball bat and whack their head off. I mean, (laughs) you start to notice, especially in the lost, and I hope God will continue to give us a heart for the lost. This last outreach, I felt even as a church, we begin to have even a greater heart than we already had for the lost. Jesus loves the dead zombies of this world. You see, sin always produces death. I I say this all the time, so let me tell you, uh, I've been here a while. It's hard not to repeat yourself after all these years. Almighty God still hates sin. And we could make a list of reasons why and even look up scriptures. It's all in there. But I think the main reason is he loves people, saved and lost people. And he knows sin always destroys. Saved person, if you don't get the sin out of your life, it'll bring destruction to your life. Because sin always produces death. Some people, you might be here this morning and say, I don't believe it. The world might say, I don't believe it. We can do this. We can do that. We're our own moral baseline. It really doesn't matter what anybody believes because this is the truth I'm telling you this morning. Sin is always destructive. Sin will always kill Sin will always produce death. And as we read here this morning, by nature we deserve the wrath of God. Aren't you glad Jesus paid the price for that wrath? Took the wrath. Have you ever, how many like apples? I love apples. I love all kinds of apples. Mostly I love all kinds of apple pies. I'm just being serious. I don't know about an apple day, but I could eat a pie day, apple pie. And then scoop about a half gallon of ice cream on top of it. Woo! We had apple trees on the farm. I don't know if you've ever been able to pick some apples your own. But I think all of y'all can relate to what I'm getting ready to uh I mean, some are sweet, some are sour. Coulter likes them old Granny Smith sour apples. So guess what he gets for his birthday from his mom? Granny Smith apple pie. I mean, she doesn't do that for me. No, she does. (laughs) You ever picked up an apple and you knew it had a worm in it? I mean, I have. You could, uh, we had trees uh, on the farm, but I mean, I I almost got a picture because from, uh, but they just have little holes in them. Sometimes one, sometimes two or three, and you can be guaranteed, you know, a, that, that a worm has got a, a chomp of that apple. And what it appears to look like, if you've ever seen an apple like that, it appears that the worm 
hopped on the apple and burrowed its way into the apple. But scientifically, that's not what happens at all. And I didn't know this until a few weeks ago when I was doing some uh, research. So how does the worm get in there? Well, scientifically, the scientists say that when the apple tree is blossoming, insects lay eggs on the blossoms. And so then, you know, the blossoms close, the fruit begins to uh, do what it is. And so when that apple grows, the larva hatches into a worm, and the worm is already inside the apple. See, y'all will forget everything I preach today, but you won't forget the apple. <laughs> this is not a science class first. <laughs> oh, guess what? I, boy, church was great today. Pastor taught us about apples and worms. <laughs> so what you're seeing, the whole, the worm's already gone. And as a little boy, I used to, man, I'd go to the tree, I'd pick 25 apples, 10 or 12 of them have holes in them. And you know, as a little boy, I want to find a worm because I'm going to get that worm and I'm going to crush it. Now, I know some of y'all love worms, but I don't. We feed them to fish. <laughs> I never could find a worm. Revelation knowledge. <laughs> That's the way sin works. It can start with your eyes. It can start with your thoughts. But ultimately the way sins work, when you let sin in, it's an also an inside out thing. Because when I observe people's outward behaviors that may not line up with something that's pleasing to God, I realize it's a heart issue of sin on the inside. Because eventually, what's on the inside will always manifest on the outside. But if you leave the worm of sin in your heart, it will begin to work its way through your mind and your thoughts it will continue, if you don't deal with it, continue to work its way through your words because it'll start with thoughts, it'll go to words, and you'll begin to think things and say things you thought you'd never think or say, and it's got to do with the worm that's in your heart. And if you don't do something about it, it will eventually turn into actions. James said it's the lust in our own heart that gives, causes us to sin. James chapter 1. Thoughts, words, and actions. And if we leave it in there, sin will permeate our life in thoughts, words, and actions acting out. And when it does, it will always produce spiritual, mental, emotional death in our own heart, in our own mind, in our own life, and many times in the life of others. Because our sin just doesn't affect us. We'll have to answer for our sin. And as the scripture says that I use often, the wages of sin is death. There's a price to pay. All right. Everybody say, move on, please. I'm glad when I was dead in my sins with more than one worm that God the Father sent Jesus to rescue me. And I don't know how to describe it any other way. It was a rescue. Even when I went into that little church that day, I just wanted my marriage back. I didn't care about Jesus, but he cared about me. Ephesians 2, 4, and 7 talks about that. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us, here it is, we're transitioning, 
Hit your neighbor and say, wake up. Be alive. God will never hem you in a corner. He'll always give you a solution. He'll hem you in the corner, but he'll give you a way out. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And read it with me. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Love it. Keep going. In order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to who? To us in Christ Jesus. We need a clap offer for Jesus. Aren't you glad he rescued you? And if you're here this morning and you haven't made Christ your Savior, he's here to rescue from your transgressions and your death you're living in today. Jesus is so good. Because we can't do it on our own. We're helpless. We can't get out of our sin. We can't, much less get out of it, we can't stop sinning. And we cannot live a life that's completely pleasing to God without Jesus, whose power and grace manifests in our heart and mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't achieve salvation. You can't. You can't even discover salvation on your own. But if you ask Christ into your heart, salvation is already yours. Through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you ask him in and he saves us. Can I get another amen? amen. We have everything we need in our life when we have Christ. Because why? He is the key to life. He is the key to eternal life. And there's all other kind of principles to learn in the scripture and even some of the wise things we need to do as we live life. But what is the key to life? Everybody say Jesus. And church, if you're saved, we hold the key for this lost and dying world. He died on the cross. He rose the third day so that we could live now and forevermore. He rescued us. And He will you, wherever you may be this morning. Because the Holy Spirit always does His part. And you may feel this tightness your chest or your stomach. You may be lost or dead in your, and dead in your sin. Jesus is reaching out to you this morning. Because he loves you. For some of you this morning, he may be, you're in bad shape. You may be close to the bottom of the barrel, not even halfway down. And there's Jesus. Because Jesus will come to where you are. Maybe he'll rescue you today if you'll let him. And the last Sunday school principle of the day is it's a free gift. How many of y'all like gifts? How many of y'all like to give gifts? I do. We just celebrated Kylie's uh, birthday party uh, later yesterday. I'm not telling you how old she is. She's in the nursery, so she's a young lady. She's going to get after me because about 12 of y'all, when you see her after she gets out of the nursery, you're going to say, how old are you? <laughs> it's a free gift. I love to give gifts. I love to receive gifts. The scripture teaches about giving and receiving. But when God the Father sent His Son to the earth, 
Jesus. He sent us a gift. I, I think that's interesting. Let's read a few, few verses here. Uh, and we'll read uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Love these two. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is, and this is not from, what does it say? That means us, right? Can't work it up. Can't, can't do it. Can't this. Can't that. Can't find it. Uh, can't pay for it, can't be good enough, thank God can't be bad enough, because this grace that the Bible talks about is a free gift from Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we say, you know, you ask Christ in, you surrender your life, it costs you everything. There's a lot of truth in that, because he wants us to follow him, not him follow us, and that's about six messages for another day. But salvation, grace is a gift from God not from ourselves, and that for it is by, and I want to read it again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that it is not from yourselves. Read that last few words with me. It is a gift of God. Keep going. Not by works, so that anyone boasts. We can't save ourselves, and I love verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, I memorized it, workmanship. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Woo! Give the Lord a hand. So Paul, in a few verses, it's the basics, it's, it's a key, it is the key, is connecting the dots for us, and he's continuing here the theme of grace. And he's saying it's not a work, or it's not works. I, I think it's interesting. You ask uh, a lot of people that say they have Christ into their heart, and you ask them, even Christians, much less non-Christians, but almost non-Christians who may be seeking, think. You can ask them. Most of the time, they'll tell you what they think. And the answer I've gotten over the years when I was going to share Christ with uh, people, said, well, you just got to be a good person and you'll go to heaven. And that's a lie straight from the pits of hell. Because we're clearly reading this morning, you can be a good person, but you don't have, that good person in you doesn't have the ability to go to heaven. I, most of y'all are like me, uh, flawed. I am. Even as a saved man, I don't have anything in myself to walk with Jesus. I, 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 this is not a boast. If anything, it's humbling. I need the grace of Jesus every day just to live for him. Every day. But you ask most people, well, I'm a good person, or they're a good person, especially the unbelievers. But a lot of Christians, because they don't know the Word, and we need to know the Word. I thought the tongue interpretations and the prophetic Word, they were both right spot on the money today. With the times that are coming our way in the next year, five years, ten years, you better know the Word and not guess at what it says, not Google what it says. Not listen to somebody else what it says. We need to crack open our Bibles. And we need to be in small group Bible studies. And, and we need to be in church, of course. But church, we're go for you to stand this next season of, if the Lord should tarry, the trumpet may sound. Amen. And in a twinkling of an eye, the church will go. But in some ways, the next 10 or 20 years will be one of the most difficult times this earth has ever seen. I'm not, mark my words. But if you've got Jesus and you've got the Word and you know the Word, you can stand on the Word. You can stand on Jesus. You can stand on Christ. And if you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll have the power of God manifesting in power in your life. But you better know the Word. 
Over and over, over the years, people say, even in the church, they say, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And pastor, do you remember the Bible says that? And sometimes I have to look at them and go, hey, man, but I, I, I'm not trying to discourage you, but the Bible doesn't say anything you just told me. It doesn't? No, but let me tell you what the Bible does say. You better know the word. You better know it. I got sidetracked. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Forgiveness is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. Freedom is a gift. Deliverance from bondage is a gift. Deliverance from a bad habit is a gift. Forgiveness of our daily sins, it's a gift. It's all a gift. And you, sometimes I can have a pretty good day for three days, and then I'll struggle for two days. It's all a gift during the good days or the, de or the bad days in my life. Some, uh, Y'all hear what I'm saying? Everything we have in Christ is a gift. Even the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a gift. So everything comes, James says, from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Aren't you God, glad God doesn't change? Aren't you glad the Scripture says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? You can count on Jesus. It's the, he's the key to this life and eternal life. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus and you can have a good day and not even sin maybe, but you need to realize that it's still a gift from God. Everybody say grace. grace. Whoa, what a gift. The gift of grace that Paul, writing from a prison, so eloquently and simply relates to us after all these years. Have you ever thought about what heaven's going to be like? You know, if you haven't, and you can look up a bunch of scripture, but just start thinking about it. Some, we probably, we don't talk about hell enough. We probably don't talk about heaven enough. Probably both topics we need to talk about a little bit more. Amen. Uh, but from time to time, well, especially, and we lose a dear one like David. And we reflect on what heaven's going to be like. No more sin. No more heartache. No more curse. No, you know, y'all thought he's going to go to what they built it out of. Well, that's another thing too. But, you know, it, the streets will be made of gold. And we all shout and jump because we get to walk on gold. I don't care. As long as it's heaven. But the heaven itself is built with stones and sapphires and emeralds and topaz and amethyst. The streets are made of gold. And all oh, that's exciting. I'm not trying to steal our, our joy on that. I mean, you talk about a house and whatever little house or big house. He said, King James said, he's going to build you a mansion. Uh, uh, the NIV says dwelling place, which is closer to the correct translation for folks that, that might. Look, it's going to be just right for you. Whatever it is. Heaven, I, I, I like to think of heaven. It, it's a good exercise in your devotions just to reflect. But then I think of really the, you know, I've lived in a shack. I've lived in a two-bedroom one. I've lived in a four or five-bedroom three. Uh, we just downsized. I got a little cabin here and a smaller house, two-bedroom house. And I, I've loved, loved it. But, you know, all that stuff's easy on earth because when you got the peace of Christ, you, and you don't care if you've got a bank full of money or not. And bank full of money is okay. It's good. <laughs> and I hope God's blessing you uh, that way. What's your point, Pastor? Because I'm making a point here. I'm thrilled about the streets of gold and the walls and the sapphires and the gates. But I'm thrilled about the fact that I don't have to tackle my temptations anymore. That I don't have to, to, to confess my sin another day when I got in the flesh, that I don't have to, we don't have to experience the heartache 
that we experience through life's trials and even when we lose a loved one. When we lose a loved one, it's okay for your heart to ache. We know they're in a better place, but our heart aches. We don't have to experience that anymore. We don't have to get the phone call anymore and go, oh, no. We don't have to hear bad news anymore because in heaven, it's all good news. We don't have to experience anxiety and the pressures of life that come in our way and the sickness in our bodies. There will be no more heartache, no more chaos, no more woundedness, no more death, no more sorrow, no more shame, no more abandonment. Heaven will be heaven, and it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And when we see him, we'll say, thank you, Jesus, for the gift of grace. Wow. There's no words. So do you think you can really earn that? It is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not that from yourselves it is a gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. So this morning receive the gift. Jesus is here. And if you're lost, he's gripping your heart. Just open your heart. It's a gift. He's a gift. And if you're saved and you're struggling, and you're struggling on your own, because I know how we struggle. We get a little victory for a few days, and then there we go again. We get a little victory for a couple weeks, and there we go again. We've got to receive the gift of grace every day to live in victory. Receive the gift. Paul invites us to receive the gift. Then lastly, he talks about good works. We're saved by grace, not by works, so that any of us can boast. But once we're saved, we are Christ. I love to use the word workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for him. God has a plan for your life. Every creature, the workmanship is a heavy-duty Greek word. It's an intense handiwork masterpiece. It's a picture of a skilled workman making something unusual, and special. Every one of you here this morning were created by the Creator to do good works for Him. Now listen, you got to get saved first to see that plan fulfilled in your life. But you're God's handiwork. If you've got Christ in your heart, you're His workmanship. And if you're saved, we become God's love letter to the world, a dead world that's dying because he's in you and his love lives in you. And he wants not only to live in us, he wants to live through us. We are Christ's workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus to do works for him. We're to walk in the last... Look, we don't have to walk like dead men and women anymore. The God of creation, because it says the Son was there in the beginning, lives in our hearts. The Holy Spirit makes that a reality. We can walk in the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus Christ, and be a billboard and a mouthpiece walking and talking in power to this lost and dying world. We were created to bring others to Christ. We were pre-created once we're saved to do good works for Jesus. Who do you work for? Say Jesus. Jesus. It's the key to life. And so, tad late, but I got the pulpit late. But I'm thankful for the gifts of the Spirit and all the other God business we needed to do this morning. Many years ago in South Africa, you would be considered South guys, just below middle there, Boris and Maggie, uh, two little boys were playing marbles. I don't know if y'all remember marbles. It's all about the video games now. We didn't have them back in the day. We played marbles. 
and all other kind of things. We didn't even have that many toys. We made toys. The, the best toy is whatever come in a big box. We could make a big box into anything, you know, forts and... But they're down. They, you draw a little circle and they're, they're playing marbles. And a stranger comes up. He's watching these boys play marbles. And he noticed, whoa, those are brilliant marbles. In fact, when they'd flip them and the sun would hit them, he would go on and say, hey, those, that's radiant. He spoke it out loud. And the boys didn't know. They're just having fun playing marbles. But they weren't playing with marbles at all. They were playing with diamonds. Y'all knew that was coming. I saw heads nodding from the front to the back. Here it comes. They're playing with diamonds. Their beauty was absolutely stunning. The little boys. Absolutely had no clue. The value of those diamonds. They didn't even know they were diamonds. They were just playing a child's game and having fun, assuming they were playing with worthless marbles. been around long enough to know that so many times even the people of God much less if you're lost do you feel worthless so what kind of value do I have for anybody anything How, what kind of value would I have for God You're God's masterpiece. Do you know that? Do you live that way? Jesus shed his blood for our immortal soul. Do you play with your salvation as if it was a worthless marble? Because to God, you're a treasure. Every one of you here this morning. And there will be days that you don't feel like it. Us? Boy, there are days that's the last thing I feel. <laughs> But see if you can remember that to God, you're a treasure. To God, you're a masterpiece. To God, you're his handiwork. So, Jesus is the key. A lot of our sin issues are tied to low self-esteem issues. Not going, you just take that home, tuck it away. Because if, as a pastor, if I can shepherd you and get you to see you how Christ sees you and who you are in Christ, it will set you free. And you're a masterpiece. I ask, Lord, how can I tell my people how special they are? I, I'm doing my best. I can't describe for God, and I speak for God, Teach for God. I can't describe what he thinks about you in a good sense. The word teaches that and the word is true. Could you give me a light amen on that? So what you know has a little bit to do with it. But it's really not what you know. 
It's who you know. And his name is Jesus. And he's the key. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love 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 you, Jesus. Lord, what a gift you are to us. We love you, Jesus. What a gift. Just a time just to pause to thank him before I make a couple prayer calls. Just go ahead. We love you, Lord. Thank you for rescuing me, God. We love you, Jesus. You're a gift to us, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Jesus we love you Lord Every head bowed. The music's just right. We love you, Lord. You're here this morning. You say, I'm here and I need the gift of salvation. Could you slide your hand up so that we can pray with you this morning? I need the gift of salvation. And that's you. Just slide your hand up so I can see it. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If every head bowed, and I mentioned it earlier, Scripture says, even while we were yet sinners, he died. So the gift is for all that don't know him. Anybody? Thank you, sweet Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now I want you to look at the rest of us. It's We begin our week of prayer. And we start this Sunday of every month There's a prayer card in the back of your seat. Pastor Christian, will you bring me one, please? We love you, Lord. While you're grabbing those cards, I want you to look just at somebody next to you and say, you really are a treasure. Hallelujah. You know what I noticed when y'all did that? 
And it's just, Pastor Dale said, do it. Well, it was touching for a lot of you. I saw it. I saw it happen dozens of times. It's because it's true. At least that's what he thinks about us. Hallelujah. We've played, prayed more diligently over your request than ever. Would, I, would you agree with that? I would. And we've been praying for the lost people in our lives. And we've been praying that we would have the heart of the Lord. And us. And I'm telling you, God is answered, answering prayer. We're getting a bigger heart for those that are dead, the walking dead. So we always want to keep praying that. But I felt like what God has put on my heart this weekend. There's an old Pentecostal phrase, an old Pentecostal prayer. And I still, I still pray this way, regular. I plead the blood of Jesus. The scripture says there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And Jesus shed his blood. So what does that mean for folks that might not know? Because we're always learning. I get that. When you begin to plead the blood, you're praying salvation over people. You're praying deliverance for people. You're praying protection uh, for people. You're, You're praying people through a situation almost every day of the week. And maybe every day, but in case I miss one, I want to be integrous. I plead the blood over my family every day. And I go from Darla and I go to my children. The Lord's hand, the Lord's protection. I just say plead the blood because I know what I mean. And then I shift from my family and I shift to you. Almost every day, if not every day. And I begin to plead the blood over you and whatever your need is. And that the power of the blood will rest on your life and the peace of God will be in your household and whatever you're struggling with you'll have the strength to get through plead the blood I want everybody here to write plead the blood at the top of your card because I felt like that's what the Lord wanted us to do I don't play the God card often but I just feel a leading that this next month you start at the top of your card and go, I plead the blood. And then list what you're going to plead the blood over. I, after I get through with you, because you're the church, the third thing I go through, you can tell, I go to this property. Because it's God's property. And not only are we a light shining, this property's a light shining. At one of the busiest intersections in town. And I, I'm going to say this, and if you've got kids, you need to go get them. You can bring them back in. We're, we will dismiss in a minute as soon as we pray together. I know we're always doing spiritual warfare. That's a daily ongoing thing. I get it. Uh, but I've felt now for a few weeks we're under an intense attack from the enemy. So as a church, for at least this next month, we're going to plead the blood. <laughs> the enemy can't touch us, y'all. He can fight us. He can come against us. He can oppress us. That's all scripture. But when we've got Jesus in our heart and we pray and we plead the blood, knowing what that symbolizes to us, God always wins. But I do feel deeply, and I bet I haven't said that five times in 10 years that we're under attack. And I want you to join with me this month especially. Every day. 
Plead the blood over your own life. Plead, your, plead the blood over your family. Plead, your blood, plead the blood over your friends. Plead the blood over this church and the church property. And, let's, and anything else you wrote down. And let's see what God will do. Let's see what Christ will do. Hallelujah. I still believe in it. I believe this room represents a ton of miracles that need to happen. <laughs> Plead the blood. Hold those needs before the Lord. Hallelujah. As the music plays, and we will sing this song. Will y'all bring them up here and lay them on the, uh, lay them on the altar face down because we want to keep private. And if you want to stay, we're going to just say a prayer together before we go. Thank you, Jesus. And if you want to stay up here, you can, or you can go back to your seat. But we're going to pray together. And if you're staying, just make room for others to get through. And we pray for them. And our prayer team prays for them. Our Wednesday night Bible study prays for them. Our leadership prays over these requests. And we're seeing God answer prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Ha, that one believes in the blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Will you stand with me? I really appreciate so many of it, but Pastor Jill and Pastor Christian, they know how to move in the spirit. Uh, they know how to be sensitive to the spirit. And the same spirit we pause for at the, what we call a transition is the same spirit that's here. It's like for me, I'm healthily humbled by the great gift of grace this morning. And that's a good place to be, isn't it? It's a safe place to be, is under the blood, in Christ, living by faith through the gift of grace. Let me pray for you. Lord, today we stand together in agreement and we plead the blood. We plead the blood. We plead the blood, Jesus. We believe in our heart that nothing's too difficult for you. We believe in our heart that nothing's impossible with you because you're the God of the impossible. We believe in the shed blood that cleanses. We believe in the shed blood that makes us new. We believe in the shed blood that forgives us. We believe the shed blood that heals our bodies according to Isaiah. We, we believe that by your stripes, your blood, that we are healed according to your scripture and according to your word. Lord, we thank you for shedding your blood. We thank you for being raised the third day. And today as a church, briefly together, in unison and in unity, we plead the blood. We've carried these requests to this altar. And Holy Spirit, uh, touch our hearts in a way that every day this next month, we will plead the blood over every need represented on this altar. Because what's on this altar, Lord, is our lives. It's the people in our lives. It's the situations in our lives. It's the circumstances in our lives, both the mountaintop experience and the trial. So today we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over our wives or our husbands if we have them. We plead the blood of Jesus over our sons and daughters. We plead the blood of Jesus over our friends. We plead the blood of Jesus, dear Lord, over our nation and our state and our community, our workplace. 
we plead the blood. And Lord, as we plead the blood this morning here at the Rock Church, we believe what your word says, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The enemy that rises up against us shall fall. We will not fear what the devil brings us because we're servants of God, pleading the blood of Jesus. So protect our hearts. Protect our households. Protect our futures. Protect our todays. We're trusting you to do it, God, because we know you're the key. In Jesus' name and all God's people said,